Welcome to Grace for Today with Pastor Lawson Purdue. Welcome to Grace for Today. We are so glad that you have tuned in. Today I'm going to be sharing on the power of one. There's one true God. He created us, He cares for us, and He sent His only begotten Son to save us. And only through the name of Jesus can we be saved. Open your heart and receive the Word of God. I'm going to be beginning a brand new series called The Power of One. And today I'm talking about there is one true God. There's not many gods. There's only one true God. So I'm going to be sharing about that. And I want you to open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to read in verse 4 through verse 6. He says, there is one body. That is the body of Jesus Christ. You know what? If you have believed on Jesus, you are part of the body of Christ. Amen. You're part of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fulfills all things. One body. He says there is one spirit. That's the spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you believe on Jesus, the spirit of Christ comes to live on the inside of you. Romans 8, 9, Paul says, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He says that, that even as you're called, you're called in one hope of your calling. You know what our calling is? Our calling is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Our goal is to be like Jesus. It's not to be like, you know, Pastor Lawson or your favorite preacher, praise God, or your favorite business person. Your goal is to be like Jesus. There's one hope of our calling. He says this, there's one Lord. His name is Jesus. There's one faith. That is the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's one baptism. Now we understand there's different aspects of baptism for the believer. But when Paul says there's one baptism here, he's talking about a baptism that is common to every believer. And so when you believe on Jesus, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says that you're baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. There's only one, you know, one body of Christ. And when you believe on Jesus, when you're saved, you're baptized into his body. Then he says there is one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and works in you all. There is only one true God. There's not many gods. There's only one true God. And so we're going to talk just a little bit about that. One God. We believe in one God. First of all, we believe that he is the creator. He's the creator. When we're talking about one true God, I know there's a lot of demon deities and things like that, but there's only one true and living God. Praise God, the one who created the heaven and earth. You know, when I go out in the morning and I see Pike's Peak and all of its beauty standing there, when I see the, you know, sometimes in the morning, this moon still hanging in the sky, so beautiful. Or when I see the sun rise, you know, or, or when I go to the ocean and see the, you know, the beauty of the ocean. When I see all of the beauty of creation, I understand that there is a God. Amen. Genesis chapter one, verse one says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. When you see how everything works together so perfectly. And all of the ecosystems of the earth and all of the different aspects about how he created heaven and earth and then he created us and how our bodies work. We know that there is a God and he created us. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. Now, when Genesis 1 verse 1 says, it says Elohim, the almighty God, the almighty God. He created heaven and earth. He's bigger than us. Praise God. He does things that we can't do. Praise God. There's a God and we're not him. Hallelujah. You're not him. I'm not him. He's still God and he's still on the throne. Now in Deuteronomy chapter six, uh, the writer of Deuteronomy went on to say, he says here, O Israel, the Lord, our God, Elohim, that same word that's used in Genesis chapter one, verse one, that created heaven and earth in the beginning. God, created, he says, the Lord, our God, Elohim is one Lord, Jehovah. That means the self-existent, eternal God. God spoke to Moses and he said, by my name, you know, almighty God, I was known to them. But by my great name, Jehovah, I was not known to them. And so Moses is recording in, in Deuteronomy 6, 4. And he says, the Lord 
God, Elohim, is Jehovah. The creator, the almighty God, is the self-existent, eternal God. The most holy God. There is none like him. We're talking about the one true God who created us. Not only did he create us, but he cares for us. And when I read through the Psalms, David was a shepherd. And David understood caring for the sheep. And he wrote all these different things. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He takes wonderful care of me. He says, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In him will I trust. He's going to cover me with his feathers under his wings. I'm going to trust. His truth is going to be my shield and my buckler. He says in Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and everything that is in me. Bless his holy name and forget not all of his benefits. Who forgives all your sin. Thank God. How many of you are glad God forgives all of your sin? How many is he? He forgives them all. Amen. Who heals all of your diseases. Who crowns you with loving favor and tender mercy. He raises us up and he crowns us with favor and crowns us with mercy. He, who redeems our life from destruction. That means that he is presently, actively redeemed. Redeeming our lives from destruction. What the devil meant for our bad, God will turn it around and use it for our good. He goes on to say he satisfies our mouth with good things so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. So many promises. But I want to read some of the Psalms to you. I want to go to Psalm 113. And I want to read just a little bit very quickly in Psalm 113. Talking about God's care. God created us and then God cares for us. And in Psalm 113... The, the writer says, praise ye the Lord. Praise, O oh, you servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forever. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God who dwells on high? There is none like our God. He says he humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. So not only is he in heaven, but he looks on earth and he raises up the poor out of the dust. He'll pick you up out of the dust. Praise God. He'll bring you from a, a state of absolute poverty and want into a state of absolute blessing if you'll trust him and believe his word. He says, and he lifts the needy out of the dunghill that he may set him with the princes, even with the princes of his people. Praise God, he raises us up and he blesses us. He says he makes the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. Thank God he helps us, he blesses us, he, 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 he provides for us, he, he gives us family and children and all these different things that God does for us. Let's go a little bit over into Psalm 115. Let's read in Psalm 115, beginning in verse 1. He says, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto your name give glory. For your mercy and your truth. Why should the heathen say, Where is now their God? The heathen should not say, Where is our God? The heathen, it ought to, they ought to be able to see our God. You know, in Elijah's day, they were worshiping idols. And, and they were worshiping Baal. And Elijah said, listen, guys, if, if the Lord is God, let him be God. But if, if Baal's God, let him be God. He said, let's have a contest. Let's have a contest. And the God that answers by fire, let him be God. Now, he knew that our God is a consuming fire. And so the prophets were Baal, of Baal were out there all day. And they, they had this sacrifice and, and these different things. And they were crying and they were cutting themselves with stone. Uh, later in the afternoon, Elijah said, where is your God? Is he on vacation? Is he taking a nap? He began to mock them and he began to make fun of them. What's wrong with your God? You know, doesn't he hear you? Well, where, where is he, guys? You know? And then at evening, finally, they gave up and it was Elijah's turn. And they were in a famine. And so Elijah said, I want you to go down to the sea. And, and there in Samaria, and they went down to the sea and they brought 12 barrels of water and they poured it on the sacrifice. And Elijah said, God, if you're God, let the fire fall. And the fire of heaven fell, praise God. And it consumed the water and the sacrifice and the altar, burn everything down to the dirt, praise God. 
And Elijah said, now we're going to take care of all these prophets of Baal. Praise God. And they killed him. I don't know what the seeker sensitive movement would think about this, but they, he took a sword and they destroyed him. Praise God. So if you're going to serve Baal, he said, praise God, we'll just destroy you because we're going to serve the one true and living God. We're not going to serve some false God. We're not going to serve some sub God, but we're going to serve the true God. Hallelujah. And so he talks about that. He says, he said, but our God is in the heaven and he has done whatever he pleased. Amen. There is a God and you are not him. You need to know that God is going to do what he wants to do. Now, he keeps himself to his word. So he always operates in agreement with his word. He's not going to go outside of his word. He's not going to go beyond his word. And if you study the Old Testament, the Old Testament shows us it's, it's progressive revelation of who God is. He says, I am your provider. I am your healer. I am your deliverer. I am your peace. I am your righteousness. I am your sanctification. And I'm there. I will never leave you or forsake you. So that's the whole story of the Old Testament. God is revealing himself to his people. And so God does whatever he pleases, but he acts in agreement with his word. And so a lot of people are telling, saying that God does things that God's not doing. For instance, if you want to know if it's always God's will to heal people, you just look and see, God says, I am the Lord who heals you. And then he says, I am Jehovah. I'm the self-existing eternal God in Malachi chapter three and verse six. And he says, I, I don't change. So these seven redemptive names of God that I just quoted, I just quoted Exodus 15, 26, I'm the Lord, your healer. And then after he says all those in Malachi, he says, I'm the same, I change not. And so we can see who God is. Then we go over into the Gospels and Jesus comes to put a face on God. And Jesus shows us who God is. In, in Colossians, Paul writes and says that he is the visible image of the invisible God. He's the visible representation of the invisible God. So Jesus reveals him even more fully. And for instance, a lot of people wonder, is it God's will to heal me? Well, first of all, God said, I'm the Lord, your healer. Then Jesus came to put a face on God and reveal who God is. So if you want to know the will of God, go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read about the life of Jesus. Coming up next on Grace for Today. But Jesus said, if you are laboring and you're heavy laden, come to me for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know why? Because you don't have to do all the work because Jesus already did all the work. Experience God's presence through the power of Jesus. In this CD series, The Power of One, you will learn that the goal of the gospel is that we know Jesus, know His call, and have fruit from that relationship. You can get it today for $14 with free shipping. Call now, 719-418-4000. When you partner with Grace for Today, your monthly donation helps proclaim the gospel to over two-thirds of the planet. You also help us support over 30 of our outreach partners, reaching those in need all across the globe. Every dollar works hard, so your gift of any and every size makes a difference. Please join our partners and all of us here at Grace for Today to reach more people with the good news of God's grace. Call 719-418-418. 4,000. Thank God we serve a living God. Thank God we're not worshiping dumb idols. We serve a living God and He speaks to us by, our, by the Spirit. So there's a God and He cares for us and He meets our needs. He says, oh house of, He says, oh Israel, trust in the Lord. You covenant people of God, trust in God. I am telling you today that if you have believed on Jesus, that you are the covenant people of God and you need to put your trust in God. He is your help and he is your shield. That means he'll bless you and he'll protect you. Oh, house of Aaron, today we are a priesthood of believers and everyone who believes on Jesus is part of this priesthood. Oh, house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is your help and he is your shield. You priests of the most high God, you sons and daughters of the most high God, put your trust in God. He will help you and he will bless you and he will protect you. And so that's the story. There is a God, he created us and he cares for us. 
The other thing is not only their one true God that created us, that cares for us, but he sent his one and only begotten son. Only begotten son. Now, why does he say only begotten son? Because God has lots of sons and daughters, but he only has one who is begotten. Now, let's look. He says in John 1, 18, he says, no man has seen God at any time. In other words, nobody had fully comprehended and understood who God was, but the only begotten son who is from the bosom of the father, he comes from the heart of the father. He has revealed him. He has openly made him known. He has declared him. He came from the Father's heart. He, he lived in the Father's house. He lived in eternity with God, but he came down to reveal the Father to us. He's the visible representation. He is the only begotten Son of God. Now, he goes on then in John's Gospel, chapter uh, 3 and verse 16. If you want to turn there, we'll read about four verses. He said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish. God didn't want us to die in our sin. God didn't want us to perish. God didn't want us to be alienated from him. See, the scripture says that we were alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that was in us because of lust or because of sin. When, when Adam sinned, what happened? Lust entered in, sin entered in, and sin will dumb you down spiritually. That's, that's really Ephesians 4, verse 17 and 18. That is a true biblical definition of what spiritual death is. Because spiritual death is being dumbed down because of sin. So he says, don't walk like other Gentiles. Walk in the futility and the vanity and the emptiness of their mind. Being ignorant or alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of lust. Right? So don't live like the rest of the world in sin. And so he says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish. You don't have to spend eternity separated from God. You can live in the presence of God today and you can live in the presence of God for eternity, but shall have everlasting life. You can have a, a relationship with God today and throughout eternity. He said, for God sent not his son into the world, to condemn the world. God didn't send Jesus to condemn you. God didn't send Jesus so Jesus could come and live so holy and make you feel so bad. He didn't send Jesus to condemn you. He said, but he sent him that the world through him might be saved. God knew that we couldn't save ourselves. So God sent Jesus to live the life for us. He says, and when we believed on him, we might be saved. He that believeth on him, notice this in verse 18, is not condemned. If you believe on Jesus, you are not condemned. But he that believes not the Son is condemned already because he does not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. What are you going to do with Jesus? What you do with Jesus is an eternal question. That's the most important question that you will ever answer in your life. Do I believe? That's the good answer. Amen? Or don't I believe? Do you believe Jesus? I believe Jesus. That settles a lot of things when you believe Jesus. Now, he goes on in verse 19. And he says, this is the condemnation. That light came into the world. Jesus is the light of the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. See, if you knew how much God loved you, if you knew how good God's plan for you was, you would never serve the devil for one more day. See, the Bible tells us the truth and the Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. It is hard to live for the devil. But Jesus said, if you are laboring and you're heavy laden, come to me for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know why? Because you don't have to do all the work because Jesus already did all the work. I had to people tell me years ago, I would come to God, I would come to church, but I can't live good enough. Listen, it's not about you, it's about Jesus. Jesus did the work at Calvary. That's the story of the gospel, and he made it easy for you. All you need to do is believe and let him come and live his life on the inside of you. 
So it says he is the only begotten son of God. And whoever believes on him is saved. Now I said, I'm going to tell you why. He says he's the only begotten. Now let's go to Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, Paul was preaching to a bunch of Greeks. And he was preaching in Athens. And they were worshiping all these different idols and different things. And so it says in verse 22, he stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, you men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. They were talking, you know what? They were talking about this is to the one true God. This is to the creator. This isn't to the Greek God of this or the Greek God of that. This is to the, um, the one true God. Wherefore, he says, they, whom, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, the God you ignorantly worship, him I declare to you. God who made the world, the creator and all things in it. He is Lord of heaven and earth. He does not dwell in temples made with hands. Neither is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything. Seeing he gives to all life and breath and all things. If you have breath, it's because God gave you breath. He says, and all things, if you have something good, it came from God. He has made of one blood of Adam. He has made all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth. God is the creator of all. And he has determined before the times appointed and the bounds of their habitation. God knows the times. God knows the seasons. He goes on to say that they should seek the Lord. These men, these people, you know, women that he made. If happily they might feel after him and find him, though he is not far from every one of us. Listen, he's not far away. You don't go, have to go to heaven to get him down. You don't have to go to the grave to get him up. He's already come. He came in the person of Jesus. He says, for in him. We live and move and have our very being. As certain of your own poets have said, we are also his offspring. Praise God. And so that's how I look at it. We are God's children. And in a sense, every person who's ever been born in this world is a child of God. Psalm 139 says that our members were written in his book before we were ever born. It says his thoughts to us are like the sand of the sea. There's a God who loves us. There's a God who knows us. There's a God who has a plan for our life. He's talking about that one true God. And so in that sense, we're all the children of God. But then when you believe on Jesus, God, the heavenly father, the eternal God, the creator, Jehovah becomes your father. And Jesus said, we pray this way, our father, which is in heaven. Praise God. Is God in heaven your father? Have you received Jesus as your Lord and your Savior? Praise God. So he said he sent his only begotten son. So in one sense, when you were born into the world, when you were born into the flesh, you were a child of God. But there's not only a physical birth, there's also a spiritual birth. Jesus said, you, if you're going to see the kingdom of God, must be born again. You must be, now Nicodemus said, how can I get, I'm 40 years old. How can I get back in my mother's womb? <laughs> you know, I won't fit. That's evident, right? It won't fit. So he was thinking naturally. Jesus says, marvel not that I say to you, you must be born again. That which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Amen. So you are a spiritual. You need to be born. You were born physically, but you must be born spiritually. Amen. So that you can pray, Father God. Amen. Our Father, which is in heaven, hallowed be your name. And it changes everything when you're born of the Spirit. You have to quicken, Paul says, who were dead in trespasses and sin. How did you make God your Father? So you were born into his family, essentially, but you've got to be spiritually born, right? You've got to be reborn. Jesus said you must be born again. So you must believe on Jesus. He goes on and says this. For as much as we are the offspring of God, we shouldn't think that the Godhead is like gold or silver or stone or graven art by man's device. At the times of this ignorance, in verse 30, God winked. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent. You've got to change your mind if you've been going the wrong direction. Because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man, Jesus, who he ordained. 
whereof he has given assurance to all men that he has raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and others said, we will hear again of this matter. Why is the resurrection of Jesus so important? Because if Jesus was not raised from the dead, he is not who he said he was. If Jesus was not raised from the dead, he is not God. Now, there's one God. He created us. He cares for us. I understand what it means to be in bondage. I understand what freedom means, and I understand what being in the desert looks like. So it was kind of like being in the desert for the last couple of the prior years before that and coming to an oasis. When you believe on Jesus, you receive his love, his life, and his life in your spirit, man. And it changes the way that you live your life. Pastor wasn't afraid to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gifts. Uh, he wasn't afraid of the scriptures. He wasn't sugarcoating anything. He was, he was real. Babes need milk, and I, I need meat. I've, I've studied the scriptures, read the scriptures, read through the Bible many times. My wife and I need meat. I get to live like the Bible's true, amen? I get to believe the Bible and see the promises come to pass in my life. It's a marvelous thing that we get to do all this. We needed the fellowship and we needed the, the teaching to enforce and to ensure um, uh, what we were believing in our heart. God's desire was fellowship. He wanted to have a relationship with humanity. Pastor Lawson broke the word to us. My wife and I got in our cars and we were just like, wow, where has that been? It's amazing. But it's not Karis, it's God who's amazing. And he use, he's using Karis and Pastor Lassa and Pastor Barbara and the, the worship team and the people in children's ministry and the people that work here to just expand what he wants to do here on earth. These walls are not big enough. <laughs> They're not big enough for what God wants to do. Trust me. Remember, you can get the entire series of the message you heard today for only $14 with free shipping. Just give us a call at 719-418-4000. Thanks so much for staying tuned. I trust that you enjoyed the Word of God. It's been our pleasure to share this time with you. If you need prayer, we just want to encourage you, just please pick up your phone, call that number on the screen. We have people here waiting to pray with you and agree with you. We know that God ultimately has the absolute best for you. Thanks for watching Grace for Today with Pastor Lawson Purdue. Our broadcasts are made possible because of faithful partners like you. Please consider joining our circle of partners to bring God's Word to more people through the outreach of Grace for Today. Go to www.lawsonpurdue.com for more information. Call us at 719-418-4000 or write us at Post Office Box 60722, Colorado Springs, Colorado 80960. Thank you so much for being a part of Grace for Today.